Good morning, people of God. So far, it's a bright and sunny day here. You never know what's going to happen with the weather here. Um, it's, uh, I, I had to go to Montgomery uh, at the end of the week. It was good to be uh, back home last night and get ready for today. Of course, I hit a, a thunderstorm on the way home. It's, it's hard to go to uh, central Alabama or above without going through some type of rain. May God's presence be with you as we worship. And you also. And Ginger Weathers, not Judy Moore, is our uh, worship leader this morning. I'm a little, I'm a little uh, different in height than Judy. <laughs> but good morning. We're so glad you're here with us uh, in person and online. Um, we uh, are all appreciative uh, of the sunny weather, and hopefully it stays that way and everything turns out Okay, for the state of Florida. So, if there are any announcements today. Yeah, Jim. Breakfast with Roy next Saturday, 8.30. All right, Breakfast with Roy uh, next Saturday, 8.30 a.m. Um, this is a free service to the community, but also if you want to come help work in the kitchen, um, I think you have to start with trash duty and work your way up. <laughs> um, but they could probably use some help in the kitchen as well. Postponed elders meeting till the 18th. Okay, elders meeting has been postponed until the 18th. Anything else? Okay, then let us proceed with worship. <laughs> as a sojourner in faith. Bring along a sense of expectancy, a vision of high hopes, a glimpse of future possibility, a vivid imagination. For God's creation is not done. We are called to pioneer a future yet unnamed. As we venture forward, we leave behind our desires for a no-risk life, worldly accumulations, and certainty. Let us travel light in the spirit of faith and expectation toward the God of our hopes and dreams. May we be witnesses to God's future breaking in. Come along with me as sojourners in faith, secure in the knowledge that we never travel alone. Please join me in singing our opening hymn, number two, six, uh, 38, and we are going to sing it two times. I'll go through it one time that you have heard it.
So we uh, meet as a community of faith to uh, celebrate the resurrection and to celebrate God's presence with us in our church family. Um, joys to share this morning. You in the corner. In the corner. So the rest of the Weathers family is at the Weathers family reunion in Oklahoma. And um, I called my sister yesterday, and she said there were 76 Weatherses, which they all have different last names. But um, so it's my dad's cousins and all of his, their families, plus my dad's siblings and all of our families. And there were 76 of the lake came to little cabins together. Wow, 76 weathers minus, well, 77 minus 1. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, it's lucky that the buildings are still standing with the weather news. <laughs> I've heard it's a rowdy group. Uh, especially if there's those decade cards in the book. Oh, not that it's a competition with cards. Okay. Audrey. While the weathers are gone, Wes was able to let us use his truck to do this and that. And it was, you know, it was a blessing for him to do, do that for us. I dropped him off at the airport, and I was able to get everything done. Good. So, With your vehicle down, yeah. Yeah, the transmission's down. We don't know when we'll get it. But we got a bike now for Ken yesterday, so he can go back and forth. <laughs> the there may be some negotiations involved. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> oh, all right. It's Wobbly. It's maybe a little frivolous, but um, our, our family in preparation for a Disney adventure, uh, we, we got reservations in line. You have to book them, well, you don't have to, but if you want to get what you would like, it's uh, two months ahead. And uh, the joy is one of the young ladies that was a it went through camp where I was a counselor and, and uh, a camp director. She is a Disney planner person as well as a registered nurse. So um, she has been a real blessing to our family because. I didn't really want to get up at 5 a.m. to start the process on, on the day. So, anyway. Okay. Um, I do, is, is this week um, the week for Don's uh, stress test? He had the stress test last week. But he, get the, I, he won't get results till the 14th. Okay, the 14th. Okay. Yeah. I start treatment this week. My turn. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we've kind of um, yeah. given that back and forth. Yeah. And okay. that's good because he, he can take care of me and I can. And that does work out well. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, updates. Um, I received a text from Hi Kozak. He is uh, having severe uh, complications with his Sjogren's syndrome. So if you look that up, it is not spelled S H, it's spelled S J O G R E N, Sjogren syndrome. I see uh, some nods. Some of you are familiar with it. Yeah. Ken has it. Yeah. I have it. Um, Joy has it. I never heard of it until nobody yeah, told me about it. Seems very, very painful, um, according to my reading. So may we be in a spirit of prayer. May the Lord be with you. And with you also. <laughs> Loving God, we do come into your presence with praise, even clapping, uh, sharing the, uh, the celebration and, and the, the joy that comes along with being your children. Celebrating the assurance of your presence with us. Celebrating the victory uh, that was achieved in the resurrection process that, that you and you alone were able to um, accomplish. We thank you for meeting us here with your spirit in various ways, uh, a 
calm, still spirit for some of us, a, a bubbling spring inside of some of us. But once again, the assurance of your presence with us, Holy Spirit. So we come and to, to learn, to pray, and in this time, uh, share concerns uh, with our loved ones, about our loved ones. Some have been listed, some have been mentioned. Perhaps there are others to be shared during this time. Jim? Jim? Lord, we pray along with Mark and Laura for Mark's mother recovering from a fall, being hospitalized, uh, focusing on her eye that was damaged. Lord, Lord hear our prayers. Lord. Audrey? Uh, Wednesday will be Colton's little procedure to find out what's going on with all his breathing and everything. Okay. Uh, with this heart issue? Heart or lung. Lord, we pray along with Audrey and Ken for uh, young Colton having some uh, serious tests concerning his heart and, and lungs. Lord, Lord hear our prayers. Connie? A friend of mine asked that we put Buck Richardson on our prayer list. <coughs> Lord, we support our friends in prayer. And Connie uh, asked for prayer for Buck Richardson. And we all know that you are aware of the needs. Lord, Lord hear, hear our, our prayers. prayers. Eternal loving God, we put ourselves in, in prayer in your care and realize again uh, your love for us and our identity uh, first comes from your uh, from your care as we uh, are involved in other relationships we are founded and grounded in you Lord as we go forward we remember the prayer that your disciples ask for as an example our Father, Father who, who art, art in heaven, heaven and <coughs> be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Oh, Tess, you are ready. <laughs> so we welcome Tess uh, with a, uh, a duet with Mary today. Thank you. I haven't seen Tess in four and a half years. She was a student for a long time, and she went to Florida State. What did you major in? Communications and environmental science. And now you are employed by? Alpha. Refuge doing their fundraising and events. If you like animals, she's the person to talk to. <laughs> Maybe I've been here 
before I know this room I've walked this floor I used to live alone before I knew you and I've seen your flag on the marble arch love is not a victory march it's a cold and it's a broken hallelujah 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 scripture is from the book of John, uh, John chapter 6, verses 24 through 35. So when the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum looking for Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them, very truly I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you saw the signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For it is on him that God the Father has set his seal. Then they said to him, What must we do to perform the works of God? Jesus answered them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him, whom he has sent. So they said to him, What sign are you going to give us then, so that we may see it and believe you? What work are you performing? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. How often do you go shopping for bread? Every week, every two weeks? <laughs> True. Um, we were uh, discussing that a little in our first uh, service. How many of you are familiar with that, with the bread store? Oh, um, yeah. It is a privilege to go shopping at that bread store. On the corner of our Green Acres and uh, Martin Luther King, no, no, um, yeah, yeah, Martin Luther King, yeah. So, um, but normally we go into the uh, a store, and unless it's the pandemic time, there's a whole aisle and maybe more of different types of bread. Pretty confusing, but I suspect that most of us. Here here, know what type of bread we want. So we go in, get our bread, and we don't pay much attention to the price, thus the advertisement for the bread store, because great, great deals are there. And, and we think, okay, um, and go on, it's fairly uneventful when we know what we're going for, what bread we're going to get. Um, not realizing that the packaging that the bread is wrapped in actually costs more than the wheat or whatever they make gluten-free bread with um, that's in there. Hmm, kind of uneventful, but we're wrong. We are wrong because 
as Americans, it's hard for us sometimes to understand the importance of bread unless we turn on the TV and look at some uh, captions or, or uh, documentaries or news from around the world where war is going on. Perhaps we think to ourselves, gosh, what, what would I do if, if I were there? We have to live most of the time without bread. Well, in other parts of the world, when there is no bread, there is also suffering and famine. <clears throat> Simple loaf of bread, something which we don't give a second thought, but in parts of the world, it means life itself. So as we comprehend that situation, perhaps we begin to understand the importance of bread not only now, but also in the time of Jesus. Think for a moment, and I'll help you, how many significant theological events in the Bible revolve around the subject of bread. Initially, in the Old Testament, the most important event was the Exodus, the trip from Egypt to the Promised Land. But what caused the Hebrews to be in Egypt in the first place. Famine. Hmm. Hmm? Famine. Famine. Yes. The crop that the people were used to having did materialize. Very good. You get a thumbs up for the day, Connie. <laughs> and Joseph, who God, I believe, placed in that position to be a manager for, for Egypt, he had the vision that saw, okay, we're going to have seven years where things are going to be great. We're going to have seven years where things are going to be desolate. And he prepared for that. There was a surplus of grain in Egypt. So the Hebrew nation began to settle in Egypt. Hmm. It was bread or the lack of that initiated that whole chain of events. Later on, when the Jews were on their way to the promised land and they were facing starvation in the bleak wilderness. God rained down bread from heaven, as it was called manna. And the people were satisfied for a while. And then they got, well, we need something besides bread. We, we need some meat. And so that was a chain of events where the people were happy unhappy and complaining. Happy, unhappy and complaining. Later on, when Jesus began his ministry, he went into the desert after he was baptized, led by the Holy Spirit to be tempted. And as the hot sun baked down on him, he looked with sweaty eyes and those white rocks there, boy, they look like they could be loaves of and he was tempted to take bread and eat it himself. But Satan was also tempting Jesus to give bread to the world, to end the suffering of world hunger. <coughs> and Jesus spurned that temptation because he said, no person can live by bread alone. One day Jesus was praying by the roadside and the disciples walked up and saw him, interrupted his prayer as they would do. You know, they, they did whatever Jesus had going, like, hey, hey, um, we have some questions. Pay attention to us. But they were so impressed by Jesus' prayer that they asked him, teach us to pray. We want to know how to pray. And it was in the midst of the Master's Prayer that we share every week, we are reminded of the importance of the staff of life. Give us this day our daily bread. I'll admit, a lot of times I'm probably thinking to myself and focusing on uh, uh, forgive uh, others' trespasses as you forgive us, God. You know, that's very convicting to me, but that is in the <coughs> Uh, of our dependence on God for our material aspects of life, such as bread. 
Most likely, we remember bread because we share bread and a cup every week. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he met with the disciples, and in that event that we now call the Last Supper, he took the loaf of bread, broke it, and shared it, and said, this is my body, which is given for you. So all through the Bible, I believe we cannot escape the impact and the significance of bread throughout the length and breadth of our Judeo-Christian heritage. So, we have this story this morning. Actually, it began last week. What happened last week? Feeding of the 5,000. So, after that event, Jesus told the disciples, okay, get in the boat and go over to the other side. Jesus didn't get in the boat this time with the disciples. So how did Jesus get to the other side? He walked on the water. Yeah. The people probably didn't see that, but they noticed that Jesus wasn't there. They noticed the disciples weren't there, so they knew that they had taken off to the other side over to Capernaum, kind of the base of operations in Jesus' early ministry. So last week, we remember, there was a small boy who was introduced to Jesus. He had five barley loaves from the meager supply of bread that was there. You ever wonder where the small boy got the five loaves and fishes? He was carrying it for his dad. Likely. <laughs> or his grandparents. Or his grandparents gave it to him. Aha! Yeah, as grandparents help us out. Yes. So we don't know, but he had it there. And at this event, Jesus fed the vast multitude that had assembled there. And once they were not hungry, he went on with his teaching, which is kind of smart because it is tough to listen when your stomach is growling. One, you're afraid that other people will hear it. And two, you're like, I'm, I'm, and your mind drifts. So Jesus satisfied their uh, hunger there. Well, there was a group that was quite impressed. A group of scribes approached Jesus. And in effect, they did say, well, okay, that was good. But if you're really the Messiah, we want you to prove it. And they pointed out that when the Hebrews were in the wilderness, Moses was able to bring bread from heaven. And since that time, there was a strong rabbinic belief and tradition that when the Messiah came, he too would bring bread down from heaven. This was kind of Moses' superpower, I think, and surely it was reasonable that the Messiah would surpass Moses. So what about it, Jesus? Are you really the Messiah? We want to see some rain coming, uh, bread coming down like rain. Well, I would be one to say, you know, feeding the 5,000 was a pretty significant miracle here. Well, yes and no. The people were impressed, no doubt about it, but you see that in their mind, Jesus' Uh, miracle was, well, okay, he fed 5,000, but Moses <coughs> fed a nation. Not only that, Jesus fed the 5,000 for one day. Moses fed the Hebrews for 40 years. Hmm. So, I guess it, miracles, miracles are all relative. All you did, Jesus, was multiply some bread and fish, but Moses made it appear out of nowhere. Well, the Messiah thought to do superior work. Hmm. Jesus, I think, looked him in the eye and said, consider this. Consider this. You had the wrong perspective. 
First, bread did not come from Moses. It came from God. Moses was the facilitator, not the originator. Hmm. You're putting the emphasis in the wrong place. Secondly, you're failing to see that the real bread from heaven was not manna at all. It was only meant to be a symbol of the true bread of heaven. The real bread of heaven comes down and feeds not only the physical needs, but also the spiritual needs. Hmm. And it was at this point, and don't miss the significance of this, that Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. He who comes to me will never thirst. I am the bread of life. So we see how bread is central to the major stories of the Bible, and it plays a significant role in life, but here today we must understand that first, to satisfy our hunger for heaven, we cannot just eat of the bread of earth. We'll still be hungry in our spirits. Hmm. Maybe that should be obvious. But once again, Jesus was saying that they were putting too much emphasis on the here and now, on physical bread. Yes, physical needs are important, but what Jesus is saying here is more important. Also embedded in this that I certainly wasn't aware of until I read a little bit of the background here, the Roman Emperor Aurelian, roughly 200 years before Jesus arrived on the scene, initiated something called the bread dole, D-O-L-E, a bread dole. And that meant that grain could be supplied <coughs> to the poor for half price. And the dole quickly became, as you might suspect, <laughs> a political tool to be used by the officials to get support. If Jesus were not careful, this whole thing of giving bread could quickly degenerate in a tool to win friends and influence people. He would become just another politician. He definitely did not want that. That was kind of a temptation as well. And I said that, yeah, that, that bread temptation has so many levels here. And the point is, bread can be used as a weapon. Hmm. Have we ever done that? Well, yeah, we have. In our own past, Democrat and Republican have advocated, well, if nations withhold oil from us, we might just withhold bread or technology from others. So, on the surface, Feeding the world's hungry sounds like a noble and ideal entity and, and, and uh, project, but when this whole issue is examined, it's a little bit more complex, and there are different factors involved here. As I mentioned, I, I think the temptation to give bread to the world was the greatest that Jesus experienced because he would look at those people that are suffering, especially children, and he understood the ramifications here of what their lives were like, but he also understood the ramifications of what would happen if he fell into that tempting trap. We also know that bread plays a significant role in every country and in every life, but also understand that to satisfy the hunger for heaven, we eat of the bread of heaven. So, while life, in its most elementary form, depends on bread, that only sustains life here. It does not make life with God what it is intended to be. Life with God. One of my scriptures I pull out, but it is within context of that scripture in John chapter 10, I have come to give you life. Life, abundant life, life to the fullest. Not just food, but food for the soul. 
So bread has power to satisfy, to satisfy your hunger in life here and the power to uh, satisfy your spiritual needs. You must eat of the bread of life. So the crowd said to Jesus after he said, I'm the bread of life, you come to me, you'll never be hungry. You come to me, you'll never be thirsty. Amen. Give us this bread. Excellent. Hmm. Here's an example that I think will bring this home. I hope will bring it home. If we look at human parents and children, parents, we try to provide food, we try to provide clothes, we try to provide a, a safe, warm place to, to live and sleep. We try to provide toys and games as our children grow. And as they grow, different toys and games. Sometimes adults, we like different toys and games. But more and more we discover that our children's needs go much deeper than supplying their physical needs. Children want to be loved and held. They want to play. They have a desire for knowledge. Or at least they have a hunger for new experiences that stimulate their interests, their intellect, their passions. So in short, they desire for quality of life and not mere existence. I believe all of us, that's what we want. And that is what Jesus ultimately provides for us, a quality of life, abundant life, a way to get beyond ourselves and mere existence, to experience life with an intensity that we've never experienced. So today, let us partake of a food that does not perish. Let us partake of a bread that is not here today and gone tomorrow. Let us partake of the bread which nourishes us for eternity, that satisfies our hunger for heaven. What is this bread? Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He alone is the bread of life now and forevermore. I didn't share one of the joys that I experienced through the week. One of the joys as a pastor is, is sharing communion with some of our uh, people who can't get out, or maybe who choose not to get out, but they can't get out. And so I visited Penny Creighton this week. Yes, Penny loves, she brings a smile to your face, doesn't she? Well, Penny has some major health concerns that she's dealing with. And so she was reminiscing about the time where she served as an elder in a congregation before she moved here. And she said that they would take communion out to people who were not able to come to church. And, and one of the ladies was in an assisted living home, and they found her... Uh, on the porch in a, in a chair, I guess, maybe a rocking chair. And, and so there were other people there and said, would you, would you want to have communion with us? And sure, great. So they gave communion to everybody there. Um, very uplifting. So when the visit concluded, they uh, packed up everything about ready to leave and one of the ladies said, you know, you can come back anytime and have a drink with us. <laughs> Sometimes people misunderstand what we do here. In a couple weeks, I think, you're going to hear Jesus say, you must eat of my flesh. You must drink of my blood. What would we think if we heard that? cannibalism. And that was a misconception of what Jesus was trying to bring about. 
we are fairly familiar with this bread and wine metaphor <coughs> because we have heard many times about Jesus' metaphor of the bread, the living bread, the bread of life, the bread which was part of the Passover meal that he blessed and tore it into pieces and shared it with everyone there. So this is my body, which is broken for you. I want you to be involved with my life and the life after I am going to be gone. So take and eat, all of you. And indeed, those meals had a lot of wine involved. Passover meal in the Jewish tradition had four cups of wine, which represented different aspects of their faith. But Jesus took one of the cups and, uh, and poured wine and said, This cup is my blood shed for your sins. Hmm. It's Actually, it's more than that. It's the new covenant in my blood that I'm shedding for you. Once again, I want you to be involved, friends. So share the cup. Take and drink from it, all of you. And every time we come together <coughs> and <coughs> celebrate, ponder, experience God's love in this way, we remember him until he comes again. said very often, communion is actually the center of our worship here. When Margaret and I were first married, uh, we were looking for a church and uh, uh, we went to Kingsway Christian in Memphis and one of the things that struck us was this is a church where they have communion every Sunday. I'm from a Baptist background and uh, we had the Lord's Supper once a quarter at night on a Sunday night for the full hour was the Lord's Supper. Every, <coughs> every deacon showed up and had a part in that. So it was a big deal, but it was just a, every once in a while. When we came down here, we were in the then Sanctuary, now Fellowship Hall. We shared the loaf and the cup, and the loaf was actually baked by Dottie Cartmill and other women in the church. That was a big deal. We actually had, in both places, glass cups. Think about that. Things you had to wash and reuse. 
now we have the hermetically sealed uh, uh, different places do it different ways. We have been at a, a church where everyone comes down to the front and you kneel and the minister comes by and hands you the uh, wafer and then you share a common cup. Wow. And they wipe it off and we know of no one who's died from it. <laughs> but it's very different. Margaret and I, when we were in California, attended a Presbyterian church that met in a school. And we got up and you would go in line, but it wasn't in tincture. It was, you get the loaf and then you share the cup. And that day when we shared the cup, it was actual wine. That was a real shock to the system. <laughs> It is not where we take the communion. It's not what form it takes. The real test of communion is how your heart is. Is your heart right with God? Now, we're very fortunate. We're not like the Presbyterians in the old Wild West, you know, those wild places like Minnesota or Missouri. <laughs> where you would come to church and you come in the back door and the minister or some elder would determine whether you were worthy to take communion and give you a token if you were. I wouldn't want to go to one of those. Uh, we welcome everyone. We don't ask if you're a member of this congregation. Many churches do. If you go to a Catholic church, find people, but you're not invited to share communion in many other congregations that way. But we're here to have our hearts right with God, to offer Him thanks. Before we share the loaf and the cup, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Almighty God, we <laughs> thank you so much that you loved us and all of humanity enough that you allowed your one and only Son, Jesus Christ, to be put to death, a sinner's death on the cross, and yet you raised him up from the dead, and we are able to call you Abba, Father. We are friends of yours, children of yours, the sheep of your flock all because of this great love. We share today this new covenant, the loaf and the cup, in honor of your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. <coughs> now we share the loaf. If I can get it open. Mm -hmm. The cup. God has shown us the meaning of generosity in the beautiful diversity of creation, in the overflowing love of Jesus Christ, and in the never-ending gift of the Holy Spirit. God has abundantly blessed us and called us to be a community that blesses others through the sharing of our love, our talents, and our material possessions. Let us rejoice now in what we have been given and in what is ours to give as we receive our morning offering. There are three ways you can donate. Um, mail in a check to the church in the plates or online to give a Join me in prayer. All things come from you, O God, 
and with gratitude we return to you what is yours. You created all that is, and with love formed us in your image. When our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You gave your only Son, Jesus Christ, to be our Savior. All that we are and all that we have is a trust from you. And so, in gratitude for all your gifts, we offer you ourselves and all that we have in union with Christ's offering for us. By, by your Holy Spirit, make us one with Christ one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. I've attended congregations that have variations on communion. Um, I grew up in a Disciples of Christ congregation. and We had communion, we had communion every week. But when we went to visit my grandparents at a, at a Southern Baptist church, they had communion on a special Sunday morning. And that was kind of like <coughs> Jim said, that was a little radical, you know, to have it in a morning service because that takes away from regular worship. But anyway, <clears throat> we're sitting there, and my mother leaned over and says, You can't have it today. But what do you need? But you had to be a member of that particular congregation to receive communion. And we think, oh, that's horrible. Just the different ways that people celebrate the Lord's Supper. Um, during my sabbatical a few years ago, the, this is, I think, my funniest communion story. <clears throat> we went to um, uh, St. Simon's. Um, Tom, the, the priest at the time there, he was one of my one of my buddies, and we'd you know, be able to talk with each other quite a bit. And so he, I, I want to hear one of his messages, see what, see what he comes up. So anyway, we went down. They have communion. You go up to the rail, and the minister and the liturgical uh, elder, uh, uh, they distribute the elements. So Tom comes by and gives us a wafer. Good enough. Well, that particular Sunday, Ted Lynch hour, who was the police chief at the time, was the liturgical elder. And he had the cup. And, you know, like Jim says, you know, after everyone drinks, you wipe the cup, wipe the cup. So anyway, we have the, um, the elements there. We go back to our seats. And Annette sees the bigger picture here and said, you know, I never dreamed in my whole life that I would have the chief of police pouring wine down my throat. <laughs> <laughs> you never know <laughs> what's going to happen, I guess, in communion. But it is a sacred moment and sacrament that we celebrate. We invite you to not only be a part of this, but if you don't do not have a church home, come and be a part of our family of faith. If you've never taken a step of faith to follow Jesus and receive the bread of life, the bread that will allow you to never be hungry and never thirst, maybe today is the day that you take that step of faith. The invitation is yours. As we share our closing song on page 583, maybe stand together as we share this song.
picking these songs that never we've never heard before, <laughs> but I have no idea what's going but, on. Wow, this is a good song. So we can do these. Say thank you very much. Yes, we have a tradition here. We uh, join hands and share the closing chorus, which is printed in our bulletin. Yes, we uh, go from here. <laughs> Faith that you may be filled with the bread of life. Amen. Amen. Amen.